The release of John Hillcoat's Triple Nine brought to my mind all kinds of questions about the state of crime cinema in America. There isn't a unified school or movement. A crime film getting a wide release these days is marketed as an event, even more so than a good horror film going wide. And it still needed a cast of every major star from TV and movies to get the coverage it's received. Once upon a time, there were enough great cops and robbers movies being released that something like John Irvin's City of Industry managed to fall between the cracks. It's funny to imagine now, but just over a decade and a half ago, it seemed like great crime was a permanent fixture on yearly release schedules. It was like we were reliving the film noir boom of the 1950s. There were films that deliberately harked back to the golden age of film noir, just as there were films that seemed content to ride the wave of stylish modern heist films. But there were no shortage of insanely talented people making no-nonsense neo-noir with comforting regularity. John Irvin was an outlier in this movement. Unlike John Dahl or James Foley, he didn't seem to have the grammar of film noir hardwired into his DNA. Always comes back the same above the roar of the crowd. That one wildly shrieking voice. He's punching his brains out. It's murder. It's murder. He made films about outsiders, lonely men forced through circumstance to take on a system. Fitting for an English filmmaker who spent most of his career making movies about Americans. His finest work may have been for British television, but City of Industry was the best example of his no-frill storytelling on the big screen. He let his cool images speak for themselves, and his montage was just voluptuous enough to bring his character's inner lives to a boil. City of Industry is about a retired criminal played by Harvey Keitel, whose brother lets him in on what looks like a foolproof jewelry heist. Move. Oh. You're making a big mistake. Ah! But their loose cannon driver, played by Stephen Dorff, gets it in his head that his share won't be enough. He decides to double-cross the team, and only Keitel survives. Though he's out of his element, he swiftly goes about exacting revenge for the death of his brother. Skipping in? Who? Skip. I'm Lee's pal, Lee Egan. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know him or not? Wait. When you know him, then you know Skip. Hey, fuck you. And fuck your mama, and fuck your daddy for having had you. Now get the fuck out of my place. Tough son of a bitch, huh? City of Industry is light on the things that made classics out of crime pictures in the 90s. There isn't a lot of self-conscious or cool dialogue. So what are you going to do? Send your kids to college. There are very few action set pieces. There's no nostalgia for past filmic trends. In fact, Keitel's arc in City of Industry seems itself a comment on nostalgia. 
Keitel is from a different era of career criminals, and he plainly doesn't fit into the Los Angeles of the late 90s. The codes have changed, right along with the fashion and music. And, like Urban, he knows he'll never be more than an observer. So he moves quickly through the new underworld, aware that his stoicism and age mark him as an outsider. Like George Smiley, the character Irvin brought to television early in his career in Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy, Keitel's Roy Egan knows the world has moved on without him. Fitting in is impossible. And like Roy, crime cinema itself, that, like a good bank robber, gets in and out with as little fuss as possible, that isn't in love with the sound of its own voice, has become a thing of the past. It came and went, and now only comes out of retirement for a particularly good score. Critics didn't make much of City of Industry at the time, and it barely made off with an eighth of its budget. But right now, I bet critics would trade everything on the release schedule for one satisfying, confident film like City of Industry a month. <laughs>